My guest today is Scott Herms. Scott, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Tell us, what do you do for a living? Uh, I am an Azure platform architect at Ken and Carta. So that means I'm responsible for all things technical on the Azure platform across all of the Americas. Ken and Carta is a digital consultancy agency. So we help big companies understand and implement new technologies, everything from strategy to design, to build, to deploy, to maintain. So um, very excited to be working in the Azure space for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is most definitely Microsoft Fabric. Microsoft Fabric is one thing that you're passionate about. Yeah. And let's start with the definition. What is Microsoft Fabric? A uh, great question. So it is a SaaS product. So in some ways, very simply, uh, think of it as a wrapper around a lot of different Azure and Microsoft services combined in an easy to consume package. So uh, people from Microsoft have said, oh, it's, it's kind of like Office 365, but for big data. Or if you want to think in the days before SharePoint, it's like SharePoint, but for big data. So it allows you as a company to have uh, one place to go to access your data and to have one copy of the data. So an important facet of that is something called One Lake. And again, the analogy is it's like OneDrive, but for mm -hmm. the enterprise, like a big data, uh, you know, like, OneDrive. Like, uh, so there's one location. Data Lake and OneDrive had a baby. Exactly, right. And so there's one layer of security across that. Um, there's one layer of governance. So as you're well aware, you go into any size company, uh, but especially large enterprises, data silos, uh, finding data, finding duplicate data, right? So uh, we certainly had that with a client we went in where they had no idea what data they were buying across the company. So they were paying for different data sets. And sometimes they would pay for the same data set two or three different times, right? So they're using wow. it for analysis, market research, you know, things of that nature. And they had no sort of, you know, centralized repository for discovering that data. So this is attempting to be the one platform for your company, right? And so that's why they go with the idea of one lake. Uh, and so the idea of a, the data lake or the data lake house, which is, is closer to what this is, is, is a combination of structured and unstructured data that you can then put in one place. You can put security around that. You can put governance around that. So using a tool like Microsoft Purview, you can then now do all the sort of uh, data leak analysis. You could do you know PII, you can label it. So you're just guaranteed one place to go and people need to discover it to use it. And there's a lot of uh, great performance improvements that also come with uh, using Power BI. So Obviously, if you have data, you're going on to visualize it. And the Microsoft answer is, of course, Power BI for that. But there's nothing preventing you from using any other visualization tool that you want. It's just that Power right. BI, basically, the licenses come baked in. So mm -hmm. if you're a Power BI shop, it makes a lot of sense. If you're a Microsoft shop, it makes a lot of sense to just sort of continue on this tool set. And it does a nice job of integrating uh, a lot of the Azure tools. I mean, they have, they have new... There's new evolutions of them, but it basically anything you can think of like Azure Data Factory, Azure Synapse, uh, Azure Data Lake Storage, uh, and they've come up with, I mean, they've come up, they've, adop they've ado adopted a industry standard um, format for the data called Delta Lake, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if it was created by Databricks, but it certainly is what Databricks uses. And so that also allows for a nice interoperability between any work that you've done in the past on Databricks or with Delta Lake format, you can now easily use inside of an, or ingest inside of a uh, fabric. Yeah, and, it, and you mentioned Microsoft a couple of times, but it's probably important to emphasize that the data itself doesn't have to be a Microsoft database. It could be Oracle, Correct. it could be Mongo, it could be uh, just about anything. Right, yep. So the there's there's two parts of it there's the the data lake part and then the sort of data warehouse the structured data the yes you can ingest data from anywhere and in fact one of the the key things that makes microsoft fabric useful i think in in a realistic world right which is that not everybody just works on azure or just works on their own file shares but they have data in a variety of the different clouds so when fabric initially came out it had what's called a shortcut to uh, AWS, right? And so S3 buckets specifically. Uh, and so what the shortcut all it was, was basically you uh, create a connection string uh, that gives you the rights to access data off of there. And now that data is, is pulled into the lake, but it's not 
uh, it's not transferred. Like the data remains where it is, but just whenever you need it for Fabric, um, it goes out and basically does a query. And I'll talk about a new feature that came out that sort of optimizes that. Um, and so basically now you don't, it, it, it's an evolving platform. It's relatively new. I think it went GA in November, I want to say. I think at Build it went GA. Um, so it had been in uh, public preview for about a year and then went GA recently. So they're they're kind of rolling it out. They, Fabric, Fabric went GA just in November? Yeah. I didn't realize yeah, yeah. it was that new. Uh, I have them. I don't know. Fact, where's our fact checkers on this? Uh, but uh, it, it, it was relatively <laughs> but not, but not new. long ago. Okay. No, no, no. no, I've no, been no. Hearing so, the term for a lot longer than that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's GA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, yeah, it was very recently. Uh, okay. Yep. Anyway, it was November sixteenth. Hmm. To, to be and precise. This is uh, just for those watching in the future. This is uh, <laughs> April 9th. Uh, yeah, so 2023, it went uh, GA. And so, you know, we had the first conference is some um, five months later, and it was a big success. It was a lot of uh, a lot of good people showed up, a lot of great talks. So that's what that's what uh, just came from that. It was in Las Vegas, uh, and I'm in Reno. So it was a short hop down, uh, oh, nice. went to uh, uh, March 26th, I think was when it kicked off and a bunch of new announcements there. So, so basically, the idea is to allow you to easily pull together your data, have sort of one layer for governance, one layer for control, one layer for discoverability. Uh, but it's, it is uh, a, trying to be a platform that can easily ingest other data sources because, you know, things live all over the place. And that was, again, some of the more exciting announcements were, uh, I believe, a public preview for um, gateways that allow you to connect on-prem data. So again, I think that's, for me, one of the other big stories where Azure has a better story than other clouds is the interoperability with on-prem. Uh, I think if you look at other hyperscalers, they might be a little more cloud first, you know, because they were people who started up from nothing. And so everything's in the cloud. Whereas people coming to Azure, I think, tend to come up of a, a more enterprise path. And so there's still this on-prem or, you know, data center uh, sure. data set. And so something like Azure Arc, for instance, is a great tool to help people sort of decide, you know, get advantages of the cloud, but not have to move or make decisions about, you know, decomming a data center, right? They can still access things, manage it. And so I think this sort of just adds to once that goes live, it'll be now, okay, now I've got an easy pathway and a protected pathway from my data center onto Fabric. Nice. Uh, now you mentioned some of the features you mentioned remind me of Databricks. Is this a replacement yes. for Databricks or is no. it... Uh... Is it complemented or how does that talk, talk about the relationship between them? Yeah, two? it's, uh, I, I mean, the, uh, it, it's a great question and it, it has caused some confusion out in the marketplace. I, I think on paper or, you know, if you look at it, it could be seen as a replacement for Databricks. But the, the truth is that Databricks has been in this field for a long time. And, and you know, so they, they were the start of this lake house. They started the Delta Lake. And so they have a very robust tool set that is used by a lot of people, right? And so if you're on Databricks there's, and you're happy with Databricks, and then, then continue to use it. There's nothing wrong. You can access, you can turn your Power BI reports against Databricks. Two of the announcements this uh, you know, past uh, week at the conference were uh, a connection to Unity Catalog from Fabric. So from Fabric, I can now create a shortcut to Unity Catalog. Unity Catalog is the data catalog, data governance piece of the Fabric ecosystem. So... A lot of the things that you can get out of purview, it looks at data, allows you to, you know, uh, create a semantic model on top of it. So now if you've already done that work and you want to have fabric uh, for other reasons, um, you can now just ingest that into there. Right. And then the flip side is also true. Is like now inside of Unity Catalog, you can point it back to a fabric uh, data store and ingest data from there. So it's really trying to give you options on how you want to run your data estate. And if you're not already in Databricks or, um, you know, you're just starting out, you can start out in Fabric. And then later on, if you decide like the tools inside of Fabric are not what you want, or you want to like, there's some feature that you see inside of Databricks that you're like, hey, I wish that was available. You can just go spin up Azure Databricks inside an Azure instance. You can use that. You can point it to your uh, data lake. You can access the data, right? So they're really... Uh, they're, they're meant to be uh, compatible. And I think the fact that the, the default, everything inside of Fabric is in this Parquet format. 
So no matter how you drag it into there, once it gets put into the lake, it's all converted into Parquet native, or if you add something natively, it's converted to Parquet. So Databricks understands that, Fabric understands it. So um, there's no need to make a hard choice. It's really just sort of go forward, whatever tool you're happy with, use that tool. If you want to switch, switch. Uh, it's really up to you. Um, help me understand the, where Fabric uh, originated. Is it it's not just a Microsoft product, right? You mentioned that it's on AWS as well. Is no, yeah, so it's an open source tool, a commercial tool? No, 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 yeah, this is a, a Fabric, I'm sorry, that was a little confusing. Fabric is a 100% Microsoft tool, right? And so, and you pay, uh, it's a it's a, it's a a pass, right? Oh, sorry, SaaS, right? So software as a service. And you pay a subscription fee that it gives you uh, a skew of capacity. So how much storage mm -hmm. and then compute, right? And so, uh, they have different sort of levels. And at a certain level, you also get Copilot for Fabric included as well. So an AI oh, cool. assistant that helps you out. Yeah, that is, that I'll talk, is. I'll talk about that because I, I have yeah, yeah. that Copilot, but I've every Copilot I've used, I've just fallen in love with. It's made yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, again, I'm sure people, if they're not familiar with Copilot, it's basically a framework that Microsoft came up with for uh, allowing you to use generative AI in an assistive mode across a variety of platforms, right? So the underlying framework is always the same. There's always like the same pre and post filters, but it's really each one is bound to a domain and they're very good about how they ground each copilot. And so then uh, even though the underlying uh, Gen AI engine is similar across all, they're all experts at solving and answering problems or answering questions, solving problems in that field. So so for Fabric, the, the two sort of use cases are um, as an assistant to say like, help me write this uh, Power BI report, help me write this DAX query. So DAX is the, is the data uh, ingestion or the data querying tool for Power BI. Or you can also use it, what they, that, what they unveiled at uh, Fabric uh, conference was basically now you can load up some data and then you can ask some questions of it, right? So this is very similar to what you'd see in like the Azure playground but now it's part of your data lake. So it opens it up to everybody else. No one has to have an Azure subscription. I mean, each user doesn't have to be onboarded onto Azure. They're part of Fabric. So Fabric very much is a Microsoft product. The connection to AWS is, is uh, really think of it like, oh, back in the day, like an ODBC or JDBC connection. All it does is okay. it's saying, open up a read-only pipeline to this other data source. And that other data source happens to be AWS. So uh, the other announcements they, ha they made were, uh, there's now a shortcut available for a uh, Google cloud storage. So that's sort of other, so now you can have data across all three hyperscalers and, but your governance, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, correct. Yep. Uh, now your governance, maintenance and exploratory data science, all that, the roles, your, uh, are back. It's all in one location, right? So you can now govern from one central location. So. The idea is to try to give one pane of glass, no matter where your data is. Now, it's not a complete set. So like, for instance, in Amazon, it's only S3, right? So if you right. have a, 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 a Aurora or if you have, um, I'm forgetting the name of the, of the different tool sets in AWS, but if you have sort of a non-relational database or you're running Mongo inside of there, you may not be able to get it. Uh, it. The other cool thing that they do is called uh, mirroring. So mirroring, if you're familiar in the database days of like change data capture, log shipping, same idea. It says replicating a database that's in one location to another one, and it's a read-only copy. So now like uh, what the big announcement they just did was Snowflake. So Snowflake has a ton of data out there uh, across the enterprise, and it's kind of been, it's kind of siloed, like nobody want, you know, necessarily wants to go in there and unwrap. It's a lot of proprietary things. And so what they've done is they basically hooked up a connecting. It's not CDC, it's not change data capture. It looks like it, but they're basically integrating with a series of native Snowflake commands to allow you to treat it as if it is any other data store inside of the lake, right? So in other words, it could look just to you like a, a SQL database that you spun up inside of the lake. Um, okay. So so that so that that was another big. So the mirroring is really nice, and you get is that, uh, is that for performance reasons that you don't have to go outside of your Azure tenant. To Correct. It's so yes. Yep. Yep. And it also, yeah, it's for generally, yeah, performance, right? And so that now the data is close by, right? And so now you have all this, this data there. So the, it's basically free for the mirroring. You get uh, allocated a certain amount of storage for every, uh, 
terabyte that your initial storage that you paid for. So the example that was given was F64 gives you 64 terabytes of mirrored storage as well, right? So that's in addition to your other storage that you get. So it's a really nice feature. And most people have, you know, multi storage, multi cloud, multi vendor environments. They don't have everything yet. I think like, you know, so I mentioned Mongo, I think that's on the roadmap, uh, but it's, so now you've got sort of two different ways of connecting data without having to go through a migration process, right? So that's the big thing that everyone gets upset about is like, I've got to, now Microsoft's come out with this thing. They're going to force me to move all my data to use it. Um, ideally, was, of course. That was the old Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. It's a new, it's a, it's a cuddlier, friendlier, huggable Microsoft <laughs> now. Uh, but I mean, you know, in the end, right, Microsoft wants to make money. But this is the way is like it's saying, you know, okay, well, if, if we can't get all of the workloads on Azure, can we have people adopt our tool and then still you, meet them where they are? which is right. I've got this data all over the place. I'm not going to force you to move all of it. Some of it right now you would have to because they don't have the necessary connectors or adapters yet. And so I think they're, they've got a product roadmap and you can go suggest like, hey, why aren't you looking at Informatica or, or whatever your, your tool of choice is, like you want to get integrated. Uh, but yeah, so, the, so S3 uh, on Amazon was supported initially. So now they opened it up to GCP. They open it up now to any S3 uh, compliant data store. So uh, since S3 was obviously the first one out there made popular by Amazon, a lot of other vendors adopted it as a way to connect to their sure. data as well. I think Min.io Min uses that. I've, I've yeah. And I think uh, Cloudflare is another one. Okay. So, yeah. So it was, um, you know, and so, and so that was another big thing. Another thing was setting up, uh, it, there's a, there's a thing in Azure called Azure Data Gateway, which allows you to connect securely between your on-prem data and Azure. And so they're basically allowing that as a data source inside of Fabric now. So, and I'm not sure all the different data types they're allowing, but certainly I think S3 compatible data stores are one of them. So that's another place where people might have S3 stores or internally as well as externally. Uh, right so hey, can you talk so, a little bit about the uh, security that's built into Fabric? Yep. Um, so there's, there's, what they had from day one was um, basically at what they call the uh, uh, workspace or domain level. So you can define a workspace and that's, uh, you know, basically a bunch of people have rights into this workspace and I'm going to put fabric items into there, or I'm going to, in the data lake, I'll allow access. And then at the fabric item level. So if you have uh, a folder that is an S3 folder, you could give rights to that. The new announcement at, uh, the Fabric Conference was they have now started to do uh, workplace item level, right? So even inside of that folder, now at the item level, you can you can express uh, the rights to that. Yeah, so, th so that's the, it's basically uh, any your it'll inherit anything that you've set up inside of a Microsoft world. It'll it'll understand the RBAC. It integrates with Entra, um, so you can can look at that. But it also has its own rights and permissions. There's workplace admins. There's capacity admins. So they allow people to, to give rights to to work in the tool or to change the capacity. Obviously, that's a big thing. Or where the capacity is located is also uh, another issue because uh, again, people may have sovereignty. You know. Uh, issues that they have to look at, you know, GDPR, you have to keep the data in a certain place. Some countries, they force you if you're doing data has to stay there. So you have to have capacity set up by region, yeah. uh, but there's nothing stopping you. If, if you don't, if you want to allow it, you can go get that. And there's a switch you can basically turn on that says, allow me to access my capacity from anywhere. It's off by default, I think, just to avoid that people accidentally violating sovereignty rules. So they didn't want it to be turned on. Um, in yeah. my role of acronym police, I have to point out that RBAC is role-based access control. <laughs> Dang, <laughs> I was doing so good. I... Ass assigning permissions to roles rather than to individuals and then adding individuals to roles. Yeah. Uh, uh, very okay. cool. Um, uh, now, I, I, I have a note from our earlier conversation that there was actually some CI-CD integration built into this, which is always a challenge, I think, when you're trying to deploy data changes. Code yeah. changes are easy relative to data changes in an automated deployment process. Uh, tell me a little about this. Yeah, so, and it is, it's more around, uh, I think, and this has been what we've seen for people uh, potentially adopting Fabric is they put a lot of time and thought into adopting uh, CI, CD and doing versioning. Uh, and so the, 
Fabric, when it initially came out, did not have a lot of robust CI, CD or uh, source control integration. Um, as of right now, uh, Power BI reports and semantic models can be integrated into Git. So it's not the data itself, but it's the, the schema or the reports yeah. that are defined. Uh, your notebooks, which you're using to run all of your different processes inside of your pipelines or running your data analysis or running your models, those are now integrated into Git. Uh, mm -hmm. The lake house itself, so not the data, but the, the again, what data is stored in there and mm -hmm. Spark jobs and definitions are, are also now, it's just a, it's a one click integration into Git. And they, they did a nice demo of now you can just sort of like you go, so you, you can go in directly into Fabric and you can branch your workspace. So um, you now have version control over your workspace that you and I are sharing and we're using to look at our collected data together and we have some reports there and we have some data sets to find, we have pipelines to find. So all that stuff is now integrated for uh, source control, uh, which is great, especially in and around are, pipe, pipelines. Must I, no am I required to use Git as my source control repository? Uh, right now it is, uh, it, the, yeah, that's a great question. I believe the only one that they they talked about was integration in, in Azure DevOps, which has the Git interface in there, which can okay. be GitHub under the hood. But I think like so you can in Azure DevOps, you can have any Git provider be one of your data sources for your repo. So right. if you can go through Azure DevOps and have a GitHub integration, uh, but you can't go as far as I know directly into GitHub at this moment. And uh, which I think is interesting because normally uh, Azure DevOps is always the you know second line for something new, and uh, but this time it was, oh, it was recent, yeah. yeah recently that's been true. It's, it's, yeah 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 yeah. It's like usually it's like oh that would be nice to have, but uh, it's sitting in GitHub, so I'll have to wait. Well, interesting. Well, well um, speaking of uh, new, waiting for new features, uh, it sounds like so the timeline here is that the product was released in November, and then there was a conference last week in Las Vegas, and that's when a all these features you're talking about, oh, these new features were introduced, correct? Right, and there are oh, so a that, bunch. That's pretty. That's a pretty aggressive timeline. That's that, that essentially version two. I don't know if they named yeah. it, but that came out uh, what six or seven months after yeah. version one. You know, then I, you, you and I've been in this space a long time, and I've, you know, you've been working. We've been working with Microsoft tools, and I would have to say it is the most aggressive in terms of new features being rolled out than any product I've ever seen. Uh, and I think, and part of that is because- That's quite a statement. It, I, I, you know, I don't know what to compare it against. I mean, there's been other flagship products where they've, uh, you know, where it's like, okay, uh, this is a lot of important things here. But I think because of the advances in software development expectations that just everybody expects more things sooner. And the fact that it's yes. also like six or seven products, you know, woven together. So each mm -hmm. of those products within the product have their own teams, which are quickly pushing out new features. So there's like a whole Power BI fabric team. And so they'll have like 10 new things every month. And then there's the, the pipelines team and they'll have like six new things every month. And so it's literally like 60 new features every month. And all they did was, I mean, the conference, they just, I think they, you know, they sort of sandbagged a couple just to make it exciting. And they also <laughs> previewed a couple. They did something that I haven't seen before at, at any other Microsoft conference. And in, in addition to the normal, like GA, public preview, private preview, they, there's a new category now, David, it's called a uh, sneak peek. Uh, and so it's so secret, <laughs> we can't even <laughs> let you touch it. Because normally they wait for it's at least like a private. Yeah, if you guys are watching you. this at home, don't uh, tell yeah. your friends about this part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there was there was one part for one of the, and I didn't bring anything or talk about that bit, but um, they were talking about they're like, like, okay, don't do not take a pic, please do not take a picture of this. And actually, yes. nobody did. So uh, he was like, we're going to announce this at Build, so don't leak this out. But I wanted to show it to you. So, <laughs> so it was a lot of yeah. It's a that's exciting. Yeah, it is, and it's what happens in Vegas. Yeah, yeah, stays, stays there. In Vegas. <laughs> yeah, it's a great community to be a part of, you know, if you're at all in, you know, data visualization, any part of that data engineering, data science, it's because it's brand, it's a brand new group of people coming together to collaborate on this platform. And the, my sense from the product team so far has been they're very, very open to suggestions from the community. And that does immediately affect uh, prioritization because, you know, 
Nice. I mean, you could, you could just think of all the different data products that are out there. I mean, you mentioned some of them at the beginning, like, you know, what's, how are we going to get Oracle in there? We're going to prioritize that over Teradata or Informatica. Like, you know, there's so many products out there. Sure. They can only work on one thing at a time. Right. And so how do you, how do you prioritize those connectors? Um, that did remind me of something is uh, one of the other connectors that I think is interesting is there's a Dataverse shortcut now too. And I don't know if you're familiar with Dataverse, but it's basically the low code, no code, uh, data a semantic modeling tool inside of the power platform right. and it yeah and so just like all of power platform it runs on azure right so it's really again if you think of it, it's just it's a wrapper around a, a data and metadata inside of azure that allows sort of the, the low code no code community or citizen developers to quickly set up apps right so uh but the idea now that that can be uh ingested into uh Fabric. So now this whole sort of shadow IT community in some places where maybe it's not backed up by IT. Sometimes it is. I've seen both models where sometimes IT is given the blessing and they know that it exists, but now they have a way in the same set of tools they model uh, and control the rest of their data. They now let all this dataverse can now pull in here. Um, hmm. So I think that's great. Uh, it's also via the shortcut. Um, so I think that opens up a lot more uh, data that wasn't accessible. And so, and also you think about, you know, your data scientists may not have even known that this existed and it may be another, just for an example, uh, a lot of the times your internal teams are maybe servicing your customers directly, right? But you've got a customer data platform that you're running professionally that looks at your public facing websites, but now you have access to maybe the customer support tickets that you didn't know about or that you knew about, but had no access to, or we're doing through some other kind of export nightly batch process. But now you have a real time connection to this other data store internally that's being driven by your low code, no code development team. So I thought that was really good too. The other thing, oh, the other thing is that now it sort of falls because Purview can sit on top of Fabric. Now you can have Dataverse also be controlled or monitored um, or governed by uh, fabric. It's a touchy term when you start saying data governance a lot because people think it's you, you telling me what not to do as opposed to you setting up rules so I know what the right thing to do is, right? And I've, right. Seen, I've seen both models where it's a completely restrictive, you can't get anything done, and then people go around it. And then the wild, wild west where nobody's controlling anything and <laughs> data gets exfiltrated and you're like, whoa, how did that happen? <laughs> so, so that was to me the other exciting thing. It wasn't related to fabric, but They've redone the user experience on Purview. So Microsoft Purview initially started off as two separate tools, Azure Purview, and then a, uh, Microsoft 365 compliance tool set. I'm going to get the name wrong, but basically it was a set of compliance tools that looked at PII, uh, insider trading, data exfiltration, things of that. And if you think of anything that you have to run a large data state in a controlled business like finance that you have to keep an eye on. And so it basically set up a set of tools that would allow you to do that across the office suite and across Microsoft Graph. So they took that and then Azure Purview started its life off as uh, a, a data catalog and really just sort of like data governance, uh, the ability to apply policies, to set, uh, you know, uh, labeling on your data, to data lineage, which is the other big thing. There's an auto discovery feature. So when they merge those two together, it really sort of this data governance and compliance tool together. Like sometimes those are separate departments. Sometimes they're joined, but if you don't know where your data is coming from or be able to track its flow, it's kind of hard to do the compliance piece. So at first I didn't really get it, but now that I've it sat with me longer, I understand it better. So Microsoft Purview has been the sort of back office tool that it's like, okay, the data nerds need to know about it and the compliance nerds need to know about it and that's fine. But they, I think they realized, and certainly we gave feedback to the product team about this as well was, this is a business tool as well, right? And it's business users who have to come in and decide, is this confidential? Is this, you know, PII, right? Or, you know, who should have rights to look at this data or you know, is under what conditions can I share this data, right? And those rules should be set up inside of a nice UI. And so they did a really nice uh, user experience on there that at least the demo looked great. Haven't had a chance to touch it yet, but I was really excited to see they understood there's a persona out there that's been missing in the past from it. So now if you think, you have Fabric, which is trying to be sort of one lake, and right, and so now you have a data and compliance tool that can sit across all your data, right? It just means they're uh, they're they're just two very good friends that are going to get along very well. So if, you, if you're not, if you, if you don't already have a tool, then you should also definitely look at that. 
Excellent. We are just about out of time. Where can people go to learn more about this? Oh boy, uh, there is. Um, I, you know, I, I share a link with you. Is there? There's uh, the Fabric blog is phenomenal. They do they do a regular okay. update on there. Uh, so if you just uh, search for uh, Fabric blog, they have you know monthly product it. announcements. Like Blog.fabric.microsoft.com. I'll put that link in the show notes. Yeah, that is exactly where it is at. Um, yep, and then there's a you know, the support.fabric.microsoft.com is also great. There's a bunch of great uh, sessions out there. I, they haven't posted the sessions from this yet, but I'm sure by the time uh, we go live, there'll be information out there. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, no, the, I did find that before we started. Fabricconf.com. Perfect. Is the conference that you attended last week? Uh, two C's yep. next to each other. Fabricconf. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're trying to, to I think they're, re- the show notes. they're they called it FabCon when we were there as well. So that was uh, uh, maybe that URL works as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, FabricConf is definitely the the active one. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot today. Great. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, and I, I really appreciate it. Whenever I want to talk about technology or make new friends, I tune into Technology and Friends.